Bonjour. Merci d'être venu. Welcome. Thank you for coming. So, this is week number 10. And uh, so, uh, this uh, week will be uh, focused on, uh, on the Hubbard model and spin fluctuations. So, more specifically, today I will show you how we get the spin and charge fluctuations and the RPA approximation, okay, that we have already seen for the electron gas. And then I will show you uh, why it doesn't work very well. It violates the Pauli principle and it has problems with having phase transitions where there should be no phase transition. So I will discuss this uh, Merman Wagner uh, theorem here. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, then uh, tomorrow I will discuss another approach that uh, uh, saves, uh, I mean, that cures these problems with the Pauli principle and having a phase transition where it should not be. So the method is called two particle subconsistent, so it's TPSC. And then uh, hopefully on Friday I will discuss uh, dynamical mixity. And then next week we go into uh, broken symmetries and then the week after superconductivity. And finally, I'll have some advanced topics at the end of our uh, of shadow. So are there any questions uh, regarding last time? So last time we, uh, we showed that the, uh, <coughs> uh, that the, the, the uh, Spin fluctuations are going to be important in the, in the Hubbard model. But before I go there, let's, uh, let me make a few comments about uh, the uh, t equals zero uh, solution of the Hubbard model that you, uh, that you have done. So yeah, you found that the uh, Green's function of uh, I omega n was equal, so, so for spin sigma, was equal to one minus n minus sigma of uh, omega, uh, i omega n plus mu and plus n minus sigma <coughs> of uh, i omega n plus mu minus u. Hmm? So you see. <coughs> If, if you go back to a real real frequency, you take the, the retarded function. You see that uh, uh, you see that this propagator that tells you that uh, if you go to uh, to time, for example, it shows you that uh, it propagates uh, in a linear superposition of this and this, which is that mean that in it en encounters uh, down spins uh, with this, this probability and uh, that that uh, cost energy u, and uh, here it, it can go without. Uh, hitting a spin down and it has uh, this probability. <coughs> so you see that this pr propagator as a linear superposition again. And uh, uh, then if we go at half filling, so uh, n equals uh, one, <coughs> when one and up plus and down equals one, that's half filling because n equals two is having a as many up and as down electrons, so that's full filling. And uh, they, then we can take uh, mu equals u over two to get the symmetric uh, situation. And then we get that uh, g retarded uh, sigma of omega is uh, uh, one half of uh, one over uh, i. Uh, so this is minus u over two omega plus i eta minus u over two plus <clears throat> one over omega plus i eta. So I was uh, sorry, I'm making, I'm making a mistake here. 
it is u, u over 2 minus u over 2. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so we are in this uh, symmetric situation that I, I described uh, uh, the other day. But we can rewrite this also uh, as, as follows. We can take a common denominator. So then the, this will be uh, 2 uh, omega plus uh, i eta divided by omega plus uh, i eta square minus u over 2 square. And that's equal to 1 over omega plus i eta minus u over 2 square divided by omega plus i eta. So you, you see that compared with the non-interacting Green's function, we have a self-energy. Right here, the self-energy sigma will be equal to u square over 4 divided by omega plus i eta. So in a Fermi liquid, sigma vanished at omega equals 0. Here, sigma is infinity at omega equals zero. Okay, so we want to get rid of the pole that is usually there in the uh, uh, non-interacting case, and uh, that takes another pole to get uh, to get rid of it. Okay, so that's the comment I wanted to to make. <clears throat> Okay, so let's move to uh, spin and the charge uh, response in general. Uh, then uh, we will see that if we do the arc reflect approximation for the self energy, then we get the uh, RPA. And then I'll show you that the RPA is not so good. So this is all based on exactly this formalism here. So that's why I left it on the board. <clears throat> but uh, uh, we will see uh, we, I will recap, I will go over it again a little bit so that we So now when we derive this, <clears throat> the three and four and one and two could have all different spins. It was completely general. But now we will, uh, we will look at the rotationally invariant case, rotationally invariant in spin. And so, and so we will take, uh, we will uh, write explicitly the spin indices for these, uh, uh, for these objects. So, uh, so for the charge susceptibility, oh, let me first uh, write uh, this. So minus uh, delta G uh, sigma <coughs> one, uh, one plus with respect to phi sigma prime two plus two, <clears throat> that's uh, equal to time ordered product. I don't write it explicitly, but it, it's there. But psi dagger one plus sigma prime, uh, no, sigma, uh, sigma. And then I have the psi dagger sigma prime two plus psi sigma prime two. Okay, <clears throat> and then I need to subtract as usual, psi dagger sigma one plus psi sigma one plus psi dagger sigma prime two plus uh, psi Sigma prime of two. 
Okay, is that clear? So I had G11 plus, and when I took the functional derivative with respect to phi, there it was in the exponential and it, it, it took this down. So now you see uh, that uh, uh, this, what is this? This is, uh, can you see this? And I, yeah, two I, I think it doesn't work. Uh, so uh, this is the expectation value of M1 for spin sigma. And this is M sigma prime at position two. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, this object here, is uh, m sigma one and sigma prime two. Is that okay? So the objective is to find the spin and, and charge fluctuation. So, so you see that if I write, uh, let me write it like this. Or if I write, so I have the minus sign here. So if I write minus sum over sigma, sigma prime of delta G, sigma, delta phi, sigma prime. <coughs> one, one plus, two plus two. That's equal to the charge uh, susceptibility one, two, okay? If you look at this, if I sum over sigma, that's the charge. I sum over sigma prime, that's the charge. So this is the charge, charge correlation function at points one and two, okay? And now I can do the same for spin. So if I do minus sum over sigma of uh, sigma delta G, sigma of one, one plus, uh, delta phi, sigma prime of two plus two times the sigma prime. Now I have a sign. So the sigma means uh, plus one or minus one, depending on the spin. Mm -hmm. So if I sum with, if I multiply by sigma here, I have a sum over sigma prime also. So if I sum over sigma, here I have n up, min, n up minus and down. And here sigma prime means I have n up minus and down. Okay. So I get the spin spin correlation function. So this is chi spin of one, two. Okay. Everyone's with me. So now to find the, the, the spin and chart fluctuations, we need to go back to, uh, to this. And uh, what, is, what is this? Well, <clears throat> it was a pain like this. So we take delta delta phi of g, g minus one, that was zero because g, g minus one is one. And then if we just do use the chain rule, then we can write that delta g delta phi is minus g g minus g delta sigma delta phi g y because delta g minus one delta phi, we, we write delta g delta phi in terms of delta g minus, minus one is uh, we get the minus, uh, minus sign here with the, the phi and we get minus delta sigma delta phi, okay? <clears throat> and what this means, okay, so it means that here we have the, let's say indices uh, one, uh, you see that we had one, two, <clears throat> and so these are the indices that go at the end here, and this thing in the middle means that the indices are the same as the, as uh, this phi here. <clears throat> And then here we use the chain rule. So, so the equation that we need to compute uh, this uh, quantity, I will not put the, the, 
I want to put uh, for now the uh, uh, the space indices. <coughs> so we have a minus delta G sigma uh, delta phi sigma prime will be equal to so uh, here I, this has become uh, uh, this has become plus now so we have uh, G uh, did I write this correctly I have minus minus oh, I'm sorry this is wrong right I should have plus here no because uh, when uh, G minus one was on the other side, I had a minus sign, and then there's another minus sign here, so that should be uh, should be plus. So now minus, I get uh, minus uh, G uh, sigma uh, G uh, sigma delta sigma sigma prime. Okay, because <coughs> The when I take this functional derivative, the spin here is the same as the spin there, so I get a delta sigma sigma prime, and then I have uh, minus uh, g uh, sigma, and then I use the chain rule. So I need I will need a lot of space here eventually. So let me. Uh, Put, okay, now I can put this uh, here and I can write this here. So I, I get delta sigma uh, sigma. And then when I use the chain rule, I have to functionally differentiate with respect to uh, G sigma, pro, uh, sigma double prime and then uh, delta G sigma double prime, delta phi, sigma prime. And I have to sum over sigma double prime, okay? And uh, then I have, uh, I have G sigma here. <clears throat> okay, now, so now I will follow the, I will follow this, the, the spins. So let me write here, I have a sum, over uh, sigma double prime. Let my, me write this explicitly. Now, if I want the charge fluctuations, <clears throat> okay. First of all, the uh, this uh, g up and g down are identical because by hypothesis, I have rotational invariance in the spins. Okay, so let me remove these spin indices because up and down are the same. And now I sum, I, for the charge fluctuations, I sum over uh, sigma, uh, sigma prime. Then uh, the, the delta sigma sigma prime means that I, I have a factor of two here. <clears throat> so I have two here. And uh, now I need to sum over sigma and sigma prime. So sum over sigma, sigma prime. Okay, so let's focus on, on this now. <clears throat> so if I look at the sum over sigma, it's a bit confusing, right? There's a sum and that's a self energy <laughs> of uh, delta sigma, Sigma uh, delta G of sigma double prime. Uh, this is independent of sigma double prime. Okay, why? Uh, again, because of rotational invariance. So this is equal to delta sigma up uh, delta G. Let's suppose I have sigma double prime uh, that is up, okay, so then it is delta G up, and then I get delta sigma down, delta G up, 
because hmm? I fixed this up. up. <clears throat> now, if if I if this had been the down, okay, what would I have found? If this had been down, then I would have found a delta sigma up, a delta g down, plus delta sigma down, delta g down. So now you see what happens is that <coughs> this is not a parenthesis. These are two, two different, uh, two different equations. I'm just separating the two. So you see delta sigma down, delta g down is equal to delta sigma up, delta g up, and delta sigma up, delta g down equal to delta sigma down, delta g up. You know, if I reverse the spins on the two objects. I'm fine, okay, I'm just using rotational invariant. <coughs> Excuse me. So it means that uh, here you see, I can do the sum over sigma first, and then, so sigma double prime doesn't matter, and then I can do the sum over sigma double prime and sigma prime. Okay, so we are fine now. Uh, so let me erase this. <clears throat> so the, there is a sigma double prime outside of the sum yes. in the denominator? Yes, yes. yes, because I showed that this is independent. Yeah, okay. All right. But it's a good thing you ask because it is indeed confusing. And it's a type of mistake I do. Okay. So it means that here what I have is chi charge is equal to, okay, this would be chi zero. And uh, here I have. Uh, I have a, 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 I have a chi charge, and here I have chi zero. Uh, these two G's, you know, remember, the first and the last indices correspond to these two indices, yeah. And this is attached to uh, to this. So for now, let me just write it uh, completely. So I have minus G. And then uh, the sum over sigma here has given me a delta sigma up, delta g up, plus delta sigma down, delta g down. And uh, here I have chi charge. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I need to change the sign here because chi charge is, is minus is minus this, so I need to put plus here. Chi charge times a G. Okay, now let's go to spin. Okay, so spin, I have sigma, sigma prime. So I put sigma, sigma prime. Here there was a delta sigma, sigma prime, so nothing changes. Now here things will change. I will have a sigma and I will have a sigma prime. Hmm? And uh, <clears throat> I will show you that uh, I can uh, uh, again do this uh, business, but uh, for now, if you're not uh, comfortable, let's uh, put the sigma double prime outside. So I have some over sigma double prime. And now sigma double prime square is equal to one, okay? So I can put sigma double prime and sigma double prime. Okay, because sigma double prime square is equal to one. Um, I have a good question about the chi charge. Yes. Uh, so uh, we have uh, up, up, and down, down. Uh, should we not have the uh, mixed spin also? Because uh, if we use the same 
rotational invariance that we said it's the same terms both uh, twice. Oh, you mean uh, here? No, we just summed over sigma. Uh, no, on, on the chi charge, so that the, the equation on the top. On the chi charge? Uh, the, well, okay, the, this these things were not there, right? Yes, but uh, we have already uh, written it on the top of the board. So yeah, yeah in this equation, we have uh, up, up on the, uh, in the, on the, for the spin, yeah, and we have down, down. So- No, 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 no. I can I take one or the other. Okay. Yes, yeah, sir. There is a little mistake. You wrote up, up and down, down. So if there is, so oh, okay. up, up and down. Up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I see what you mean. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, we are, we we need to have uh, both configuration of spin. Yes, th this is correct now. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Now we go to spin. <clears throat> So, okay, I have sigma, sigma prime, and then I did this uh, thing, yeah. So what happens here if I do, if I put sigma and sigma double prime here? Okay, so suppose that sigma double prime is up, so the, this is plus one, okay? Then when I do uh, this, uh, you see that uh, what will happen is that when sigma, when I have up, it's okay, but when I have down, I get the minus sign, okay? Okay, now suppose I have a down spin here. <clears throat> so if I have a down spin, when I sum over sigma and I get the, uh, I get the, this, now I have a minus sign. Okay, because the spin is, is down, but this one is up. So, so that gives me an overall minus sign. And then when the, the two spins are down, I get the, the plus sign. Okay, so again, uh, this is equal to that, and this is equal to that. Okay, and this is the chi. This is uh, 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 the the chi spin. <clears throat> so I get that chi spin is equal to chi zero plus a g, and then I get uh, this. <clears throat> Delta sigma up and delta g up minus delta sigma down delta g up times chi spin times g. Okay, and I change the sign here because of uh, this is defined with the minus sign. <clears throat> Okay, I hope this is okay. <clears throat> it's the perfect day to make a sign mistake. Hmm? And now I'm erasing everything. So it means that if I have a sign mistake, I won't be able to see where it comes from. <clears throat> so you see there's a vertex for the charge, uh, this uh, irreducible vertex. And it is different from the irreducible vertex for the spin. Okay, now we uh, we do the uh, Artifac approximation for sigma, and then I will get the RPA equation for the spin, the charge and spin fluctuation. So this is uh, similar to what we did huh? the, before. To get RPA, we just use these two diagrams. This one was zero, we use just this one, and that gave us two terms. Okay, so, so, so. <clears throat> we look at uh, our three I have that uh, 
<coughs> uh, sigma of one three uh, is equal to minus u and this is spin sigma delta g sigma one three uh, delta phi <coughs> Uh, I'm confused now. Minus minus g of one one plus g of one two. Okay, I understand what's happening there. This is uh, sigma times g. So this is two. So, so we have uh, sigma sigma of one one bar times g sigma of one bar two <coughs> uh, is equal to this. If we look, we have uh, u and then this because the because of the u which is uh, on the same uh, side, I guess I get uh, uh, one plus uh, one minus g one two there. Okay. Now to get our tree fork, I just neglect this term. So our tree fork is just uh, is just this. So now what I do is that I multiply by g minus one on both uh, both side, and I get uh, uh, the self energy of one, three, let's say, is uh, equal to u, uh, g of one, one plus, and then when I multiply here, I get delta one minus three. Okay, you see, I multiply by, I multiply by g minus one of two, three, and then I summed over the two, yeah. So that gave me here that gives me delta one minus three. Okay. Now let's compute. Uh, let's compute these vertices. So if I look at uh, delta uh, sigma sigma of one three. Delta G sigma the O. Oh, this is minus sigma. <clears throat> uh, and this is minus sigma. <clears throat> so I get uh, delta G sigma delta, let's say, uh, uh, four uh, delta. <clears throat> yeah, let's take four or five if you want. Now, th this is zero if the spin are parallel. Why? Because here I have minus sigma. Okay, let, well, okay, I, 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 I see that it's confusing now. Let me, let me write uh, this sigma times g. Remember, this came from the equations of motion. This. <clears throat> so when I take the commutator of the field operator, 
with the uh, the interaction. The interaction is local. Okay, so I have you see that I have I have one uh, one and the spin uh, I, you know, up interacts with down only in in the Hubbard model. So I have up and down. <clears throat> so that's why I, 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 you get this with the minus minus sigma. I should have written this equation. Okay, so this is zero. Now, if I look at the uh, if I look at the opposite case, if I put a minus sign here, so if I put a minus sign here, then this is equal to Uh, this is, is equal to uh, u, and then I have delta 4 minus 1, delta 5 minus 1, and I have delta 1 minus 2. Okay, so I get delta functions all over the place. Okay. So it means that this is easy to write now. <clears throat> so let's get rid of this. So in the arc reflux approximation, I get that I have too many pen. And I get that the high charge of Q. So I go in now in wave vectors. I, guess I go back to translation and invariance. I get chi zero of Q. And then it's only this that corresponds, that uh, contributes, okay? <clears throat> and the chi zero, remember, there's a mi it was minus gg. So, so here I have, this becomes uh, minus uh, chi zero of q divided by two, because the, the chi zero is minus two times gg. And uh, here I just have uh, u, uh, uh, u, yes, times uh, chi charge of q. Okay, I didn't work out all the, the details, but because of all these delta functions that are in the way, then it simplifies a lot like this. <clears throat> and then chi spin of q is equal to chi zero of q. <clears throat> Plus, okay, because now it's the only thing that contributes is this. So plus uh, chi zero of Q over two times U times chi spin of Q. Okay, it was hard work, but we finally got it. Okay, so we're happy with this. So what is the problem now with, uh, with these results? Okay, I'll show you first that it violates the Pauli principle. So I have that the chi charge equal to chi zero one plus 
u over two chi zero, and chi spin is equal to chi zero over one minus u over two chi zero. Now what happens if I take, if I sum over all match bar frequencies, like you n, and I sum over all wave vectors, q, of chi charge. <clears throat> so um, uh, I, I take uh, sum over, I'll take sum over two over n. So, so if I sum over all wave vectors, and all match bar frequencies, it means that uh, the, uh, I go to the same point in space and in time. Okay, it's property of uh, Fourier transforming. If I take, <coughs> if I take uh, uh, sum over Q, E to the I Q dot R, chi of q, that gives me chi of r. So when q, when, I, when, I, when, the, when this is not there, I get, it's the same as r equals zero. Okay, so it means that I have n up, uh, the, the two ends are, uh, are at the same uh, spot in space and in time. And in, in imaginary time, but uh, you know, being at the same place in imaginary time is being is the same as being at the same place <coughs> in real time. So, so this this is equal to n up plus n down square minus n square, because you remember we have to do the subtraction. So this is equal to n up square, but n up square, if I use Pauli principle, n up square is equal to n up. Why? Because n up is one or zero. So if I take the square of one, it's one, and the square of zero is zero, okay? So this is the same as n up plus n down, and then there's a cross term. So I get plus, two times and up times and down minus so I will write n square here and what is this and up plus and down is just uh, n Now, if I do the same with the spin, I get the M. The only thing that changes is I have a minus sign here. So minus two and up and down. And uh, and then I get minus S Z square, but the expectation value of S Z is zero because of, of the rotational invariant. So it means that if I add these two equations now, you see these two, there's a minus and a plus here, so they beg to be canceled. Hmm? So it means that I have T over N sum over IQN sum over Q of chi charge is this. So I write chi zero one plus U over two chi zero. Chi spin is this. So this is plus chi zero one minus U over two chi zero. 
Um, so if I add this plus this, okay, this is, what do I get? I get 2n minus n square. So this is just a filling, it's independent of u. And why is it independent of u? It's because I use the Pauli principle here to do this. Now, if you expand this to first order in u, you see that it's fine, it's fine because chi zero obviously obeys this, chi zero obeys the Pauli principle. But uh, you see that to second order in u, this will depend on u and not that. Okay, so that's why RPE violates the, the Pauli principle. And <clears throat> oh, let me leave this here, chi charge. And the chi, chi zero in, uh, uh, in Matsubara frequencies is always positive. So you cannot count on, uh, you cannot count on chi zero doing something special for you. Even if it did, it, it couldn't do it couldn't do it for all values of u. So to second order in u, you violate the Pauli principle. Why is that from the point of view of diagrams? I can show you. So if you remember in RPA, <coughs> We, uh, we were just summing over spins all the time. We were just interested in uh, the charge fluctuation. <coughs> so in particular, uh, we had uh, for the charge fluctuation, uh, we had, uh, we looked at one diagram like this. I had, that I have k, uh, k prime, uh, let's say k plus q, uh, k prime plus q. And here we have k, k prime, and then we have this diagram. With the, the same labels here for the for these things. Now, uh, because v of q was singular, right? V of q was proportional to one over q square. We said that this is the important diagram. This one here, we have the, the, this momentum that's transferred. It's k minus k prime, and we're integrating, so it doesn't give any singularity. So we took into account only these diagrams. So take up spins here everywhere. Up, 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 up. But now suppose that this is this is u. So u is completely local. So u is independent of q. So these two diagrams are identical. And there's a minus sign in between, so they cancel each other. Okay, that's how the Pauli principle is satisfied to first order in u. We said it's first satisfied to first order in u. If I take up uh, everywhere, up everywhere, then you see that this is independent of q. So doing the loop integral here and the loop integral here will give you exactly the same result as, as this. But there's a minus sign in between, so it, it, it disappears. So we say, okay, the, Pauli, the, the, the Hubbard model up interacts only with down, okay? So that's how to first order in U, we got this to work out because this uh, is not possible. I mean, here this diagram does not exist and this one no, does not exist either. So it's the same as saying that they cancel. But if you want to satisfy the Pauli principle to higher order, for example, suppose, suppose you have uh, something like this, okay? Then to satisfy the Pauli principle, you need to take into account all the exchange diagrams. You see, every time you exchange <coughs> uh, uh, lines here, uh, <coughs> This is how you get rid, this is how you take care of the, 
of the Pali principle. So to, to, to include, to have the Pali principle here, what we need is, for example, take this arrow and uh, have it uh, finish uh, here instead of this one, okay? And then take, take this one here and have it uh, finish uh, here, okay? So this, this arrow will be, uh, will be there. Uh, uh, would be here, and this arrow <coughs> would be uh, would be there. So that, that's another diagram. So let me erase uh, the lines that don't come in anymore. So uh, this is gone. So instead of ending here, it ends there, and this one instead of ending there, it ends here. So we remove uh, we remove this, and we go like this. So if we were able to to do all these ex, all these exchange of lines, it would work out. We would satisfy the Pauli principle. In other words, perturbation theory to any given order in U, if you take into account all the diagrams, Pauli principle is satisfied. But you see that what we are doing here is just summing these bubble diagrams. <clears throat> so that's why the Pauli principle is not. Uh, is not satisfied. So this is uh, this is uh, here. Now, uh, you see uh, that what will happen here in this uh, because of this minus sign, it's possible if you know depending on the value of chi zero, it's possible that this chi spin becomes negative. And it can become negative, in particular, at zero frequency. But at zero frequency, this is just a thermodynamic derivative. It's like dm, d uh, spin, if you want, dh. Mm -hmm. Or this would be like dn, d mu, if you like, take a q equals zero. So, so there are convexity. Uh, relations and thermodynamic that don't allow these response function to be negative that corresponds to an instability. <coughs> so <coughs> another way to see that that this cannot happen uh, this cannot happen you can write uh, chi uh, spin at the zero frequency will be equal to uh, integral uh, u mega prime over pi of chi double prime spin of omega prime divided by omega prime. So this function is odd in frequency. So that's the zero frequency thing. Now, if this is negative, it means that this for positive frequencies has to be negative. But we saw that chi double prime at positive frequencies is positive because of dissipation. Okay. <clears throat> chi double prime is positive at positive frequency and negative at negative frequency. But if we want this to be negative, it means that this has to have the wrong sign. So the, the dissipation will not be uh, positive. There won't be dissipation. So when uh, this happens, you know, when, when, when u and chi zero combine in such a way that they are larger than one, u over two times chi zero is larger than one, this leads to something negative here. So that's an instability. It's a phase transition. And this is what we will discuss next week, phase transitions, and we see how they come about. We go to the normal state, and then the normal state becomes uh, unstable. And uh, now I will finish with this. In two dimensions, that cannot occur at finite temperature. There, there, can be, there cannot be a phase transition at finite temperature. Uh, here, a uh, uh, phase transition in, in the spin at finite temperature. <coughs> Why is that? 
so if I'm, I'm going to do, there's a way to prove this rigorously, but I'm just used to use a simple phenomenological argument. So if you look at the, the free energy uh, functional, so if I do, you know, I'm supposed to do, to compute the partition function, I'm supposed to, suppose the spins are all aligned and then phi is a, the angle where they, you know, they start to move with respect to each other and there's an angle related to this. So I need to integrate over all angles and E to the minus, uh, so here what will happen is that I will have a term that will be proportional to the gradient of phi. You know, I am assuming that there is some long range order. <clears throat> Uh, over k d t. Okay, so the restoring force has to be proportional to the, the gradient. Uh, so uh, if I go to Fourier space, uh, then this is like q square phi square. Now, if I use the equipartition theorem, I know that phi of q, phi of minus q will be equal to kbt over two. And here I have a q square. Okay, so this is just equipartition theorem, classical equipartition theorem. So it means that phi of q, phi of uh, minus q is uh, this divided by q square. So if I assume that I have long range order in two dimensions, you see that uh, to get the local you know, phi square at site i, I need to integrate d square q, phi of q, phi of minus q and there's one over q square. So you see d square q divided by q square is logarithmically divergent. So this is a proof by contradiction. I assume that there was no range order. Then there has to be a restoring force proportional to the square of the gradient. And using equipartition, I find that it means that the fluctuations are infinite are at a given site are infinite. So I cannot break the symmetry and have the, all the spins in the same direction. Okay, so the, the RPA violates the merman wagner theorem. And so next time I'm going to show you uh, with the TPSC, two particles have consistent approach, how we can cure both the Pauli and the merman wagner uh, problem. And uh, then we will, we will go to, uh, uh, on Friday to dynamical mean field theorem. Okay, any questions? Okay, so thank you for coming. If you have some questions you want to ask in private, I'm staying around. Thank you, have a great day, bye.